Let's look at trends in ionization energy. A good thing to note is to remember the trends in atomic radius because they more or less explain the attractive force between the nucleus and the outside electrons and then we can apply them to other quantities. Important thing to note is remember the trends for atomic radius and remember the definitions for the other trends. So let's remember that the ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. These are always positive numbers because it always takes energy to take an electron and act against that attractive force and pull it away from the nucleus. Metals tend to lose electrons more easily. You should know that. Okay, because if you look at the a period going across. Remember, what happens to the atomic radius as I go across? Well, the atomic radius decreases because that attractive force for the electrons is increasing. Number of protons is increasing. Number of electrons are increasing as well, but those electrons are on the same energy level. Okay? They don't see the other electrons on that energy level as well, so they get pulled into that positive nucleus. Okay? So if the electrons are on this side of the periodic table, non-metallic character over here, electrons are going to lose the electrons more easily because the attractive force is less. Non-metals, again, tend to gain them. And the ionization energy increases across a period because the pull increases. And what do we call that pull? Oh, I would call it the Z effective increases as I go across. So what are my trends in ionization energy? The ionization is at the highest at the top of a group and it decreases as it goes down due to that shielding effect. Okay. So the ionization energy increases again going across those main group representative elements. Okay. And it decreases going down. The radius is getting bigger due to that shielding effect. Ionization energies are periodic. You can see a trend as we go across. Okay. Things to note are this slight discrepancy. This is between beryllium and boron. Beryllium is a 1s2, 2s2, 1s2, 2s2, boron 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. This one electron in a sublevel, um, outermost, is easier to remove than the relatively stable two electrons in a fully filled s sublevel. The second discrepancy you may have noticed is here. That is between nitrogen that has its p3 electrons in a p sublevel, all with the same magnetic spin, and the oxygen that has four in that sublevel. This electron being in another orbital with another electron has some slight repulsive forces. It's easier to remove then the relative stability of three electrons in the three p orbitals all with the same magnetic spin. Second type of quantity that we need to remember. Actually, let's watch a movie first. Hang on. Um, Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom or ion. It measures how strongly an atom holds its electrons. The first ionization energy, I1, is the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom. Considerably more energy is required to remove a second electron from the positive ion. This energy is called the second ionization energy, 
I2. As each electron is removed by ionization, the remaining electrons experience less electron-electron repulsion and a greater effective nuclear charge. Thus, each successive ionization requires more energy. This graph shows the way in which the ionization energies of the aluminum atom increase as successive electrons are removed. Notice that the ionization energy increases with each successive removal of an electron. However, there is an especially large jump in the energy required for removal of the fourth electron. From a knowledge of the electron configuration of neutral aluminum, can you account for this dramatic jump? Okay. okay. And please note that she, she called it an I. I probably would have said IE for ionization energy. Okay, going on to the next trend, electronegativity. Remember the definition. The electronegativity is the measure of an ability of an atom to attract electrons in a chemical bond. It was first proposed by Linus Pauling, 1901 to 1994. Wow. He later won a Nobel Prize for his efforts. Way to go, Linus. Okay, so periodic trends in electronegativity. The most electronegative is that fluorine atom. The relatively high Z effective. Very little electrons in that first uh, energy level. Okay, so in a group, the atoms with the fewer energy levels, meaning less shielding, are going to be the highest electronegativity. Okay, so electronegativity increases going up a group. In a period, the electronegativity is going to increase with the number of protons, or the Z effective. So the electronegativity increases up and to the right. Fluorine highest, francium least electronegative. And if you notice, they don't tend to include the noble gases um, because they have that fully filled energy level. Okay. Unreactive, you're really going to be wanting to do some... Anyway, the, the Pauling scale goes from um, less than one to four. Fluorine set at four is the most electronegative. Um, they also are kind of the anti-metallic character. Fluorine is the most anti-metallic. Francium or cesium would be the most metallic. And you can see this, I like this, these graphs, these 3D bar graphs showing the electronegativity, how high fluorine is, and how low you go with the um, cesium there. Okay. Electron affinity. This should be a new trend for us. Remember the definition. The electron affinity is the energy change. Energy change. When an electron is added to the neutral atom to form a negative ion. This is the equation for the electron affinity. It can only be measured in an atom in a gaseous state. Okay, so the neutral atom adding an electron, becoming a negative ion, what would the energy change be? Interestingly to note, here is a table of electron affinities in kilojoules per mole. You notice that some elements just say greater than zero greater than zero, well that's a positive energy change, so that's endothermic. That means it takes energy to make those atoms take an electron. Nitrogen has a positive electro, um, electron affinity, beryllium and magnesium as well. You can see that the um, electron affinity for chlorine, negative 349, fluorine, negative 329, but you can also form negative ions of the alkali metals. You just don't get as big an energy change. And remember with this exothermic, 
Okay, the larger exothermic, the lower energy state that ion is, the more stable typically that that ion is. These trends aren't um, anything that you can really describe. Uh, they do um, There's no clear-cut trends. And here's your electron affinity. They're not as nice, I should say, trends as you would see with the electronegativity or ionization energy or atomic radii. So how about melting points? Here we're looking at the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. You can see generally that they um, increase as I go down the group, as I'm getting larger molecules. Remember these molecules are nonpolar molecules, diatomic nonpolar molecules, nonpolar, um, covalent. So we're looking at intermolecular forces and since these are nonpolar, specifically our London dispersion forces. Ah! I don't know why that happens. I hold my pen weird sometimes. London dispersion forces. Okay, these were the squishy forces. As my molecules get larger, the polarizability of that electron cloud incre increases, London dispersion forces increase, my melting point increases. Okay, and hopefully this makes sense with the state of these elements as you know them. Fluorine is a gas at room temperature. Chlorine is a gas at room temperature. Bromine is a liquid at room temperature. And you can see this room temperature mark between the melting point and the boiling point, and then iodine with its solid nature at room temperature, the melting point is way above that room temp. Now let's look at the elements on the other side of the periodic table, those alkali metals. Hopefully you know that the alkali metals are all solids at room temperature, and you can see their melting points are pretty high. Can particularly compared to the melting points of fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. Cesium is the one that's um, the lowest. So as the melting points increase as I go down the halogen group, the melting points actually decrease going down the alkali metal group. Huh. Why would the melting point go down as we move down the group? Hopefully you realize that metals are not nonpolar covalent bonded substances. They are not. They are metals. They bond metallically. The me metallic bond are a uh, attraction between nuclei and delocalized electrons. Metals tend not to hold those outer valence electrons very strongly and it's, only, it's like a sea of electrons is typically the model that you hear about. A sea of electrons, that should be an F, sea of electrons, okay, going through the nuclei of the atom. As the atoms get bigger, the attractions between that nuclei and the electrons get weaker because those electrons are farther away from that nucleus. They're farther away from that positive charge, you have more of that shielding effect as those atoms get bigger. So then as a result, those bonds aren't as strong, it's easier to melt the metal. And then just subbing up for the group 7, elements existing as diatomic covalent molecules, those are those intermolecular forces, the van der Waals or the London dispersion force. Those get stronger as that molecule gets bigger because of that, that intermolecular force, how it works with the polarizability of the electron cloud. So those bigger molecules, it's actually harder to break those intermolecular forces. 
so the melting point increases as we go down with halogens. Okay. So, just to recap, melting points increase with stronger bonding and intermolecular forces. It is a measure of the difference in force between the solid and the liquid states. Boiling point is a measure of the absolute size of those forces. Because remember, when I turn it into a liquid, it's almost kind of like the um, attractive forces are balanced out with that kinetic molecular motion that there is still an attractive keeping them in contact. Boiling them, there is no attractive force between those atoms or bonds, between those atoms, molecules, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. So, across a period, I go from metallic to covalent, giant covalent, which are very strong, and then to van der Waals forces between the molecules, which are relatively weak. So, melting points reach a maximum at group 4. Melting points reach a maximum at group 4. It's because we're going from a metallic bond to a giant covalent to weak van der Waals forces between the molecules. Okay, so hopefully you can um, list the, basically the three trends that you can list trends for, atomic radius, electronegativity, and ionization energy, what they do going across a period, down a group, down a group, remember it's the shielding effect, um, going across a period, it is more Z effective. How effectively can that nucleus and the positive charge attract the electrons on the outside? Okay. That ends this screencast.